Greetings and welcome back everyone to AutoCAD's Essential Training. This is Series 2 out of 3 sessions. This training is provided to you by Florida Department of Transportation, the Plan Production Office, and the CAD Department. Again, my name is Mike Rocca and I will be your presenter today. So let's get started. In this session, we're going to talk about creating objects. We're going to go through creating lines, arcs, circles, rectangles, ellipse, polylines, 3D polylines, and the flatten command. Basically, most of the commands that are on the draw panel on the home ribbon. Then we're going to talk about the status bar located on the bottom right hand corner of the user interface in AutoCAD. We're going to go over object snaps, AutoCAD map 3D tracking coordinate system. We're going to talk about switching between model space and paper space, ortho mode, polar tracking, selection cycling, and annotation objects. And then last today we're going to talk about the modify tools. All the tools that are located on the modify panel on the home ribbon. We're going to go over the erase command, move, stretch, copy, rotate, and explode. So first of all, we're going to talk about creating objects on the draw panel. We're going to look at creating lines, rectangles, arcs, polylines, circles, and ellipse. We're going to talk about the steps you go through, how to communicate with the command line, going through each step, and how to execute these commands properly. And also give you some different ideas on how you can go through and create lines um, and different methods that you may not be aware of. Okay, so now that I've got the Civil 3D st State Kit launched, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and set my project. This is what you would normally do when you're working in Civil 3D, is to make sure that your data shortcut is pointing to the correct uh, directory. So I'm going to go here and say right click and choose Set Working Folder. I'm going to browse down to Civil 3D Projects. This is the AutoCAD Essential Data Set. I'm going to select the top level folder that contains my project. And this is the project that I'm ultimately going to select. But I will select the folder containing your projects first. This is your working folder. I'm going to click OK. If that's your only project in that folder, Civil 3D will go ahead and set that project for you. But if it didn't set that project for you, you can right click on again and choose Set Data Shortcuts Project Folder. And then here in that project folder, you'd have multiple projects. You can just select that one. But it's already selected for me because Civil 3D knows that that's the only project I have in that folder. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Now I'm going to create a new drawing. So I'm going to go to the F dot ribbon, and I'm going to choose the Create File icon. And that's basically what this big logo here means and this little note that's underneath it. It means that if you're using the State Kit and you want to create a file that is F dot compliant, you want to use the Create File application. So that's what we're doing here. So I'm going to choose Create File, <clears throat> and up here on the top, just kind of work your way down. We're going to make sure that our project is set. If it's not, you would, you would choose Select Project and then pick on that project number. For our discipline, I'm just going to go ahead and choose Roadway, and then I'm going to go down here and choose Roadway Design Files. And then I'm going to scroll down a little bit and pick my file type that I want to create. So I'm just going to choose Proposed Design. We're not going to draw anything particular, but I just want to show you how you would create your own DWG file using the state kit. So once you pick the file, it says, okay, this is the output file that you're going to create. It's going to give it a name, DSGN, RD, and it's going to put some number after the after the end of it, depending on how many file types of this name that you create. It's going to place it in the roadway folder. It's using the f.master as the template. And in here, if you want to, um, we have some coordinate zones in, for Florida that you can um, apply to your drawing. I'm just going to go ahead and say FL East for Florida East and then create open file and then close out of this file. So now we have a new drawing up on top. Uh, we have the name here of the file that we're working in and we have the file name up on top as well. And then go ahead and click save up on the top. Okay, so what we're going to look at is how to draw lines first. So I'm going to click on the home ribbon on the top left hand corner and I'm going to go over here to the draw panel. If you click on the down, you can see there's many different ways of drawing lines. We're just going to stick to the basic um, line command. The line command creates straight line segments. And then you can read the description here. With line, you create a series of continuous line segments. Each segment is a line object that can be edited separately. So, again, a few ways to uh, execute the line command. I'm just going to quickly review. You can click on the icon. You can type in L for line. Or you can type in the word line. Okay, but for this example, I'm going to go ahead and just click on the icon. Okay, so just kind of follow the um, the command line. It says specify first point. So every time you left click on your mouse is when you're play, uh, picking a point on the screen. 
Okay, so if you just want to pick a random point on the screen, you just left click a few times and that creates your line. When, you're com when you've completed drawing your line, you just right click and you can choose enter. Or let me do this again, I'll choose the line command. I'll pick a few lines. I can press enter on the keyboard. That's uh, like right clicking and pressing enter on the key on the um, on the mouse. Or if I choose the create line command again, if I press the space bar, that ends the command also. If you want to repeat the last command that you did, you can press the space bar key and that will repeat the line command. You can also right click and choose repeat line or go to recent input and choose one of the inputs or one of the last commands that you entered. Um, when you draw a line, a line can have different elevations at each end. If you want to see what the elevations are at each end, you can select the line and take a look at the properties box that we talked about in the previous session. In the properties dialog box, you can change the X and Y, you can uh, change the start Z elevation, and you can change the end Z elevation uh, from here as well. Just be aware that if you do give a, a single line different elevations, uh, they may not join together when you're trying to uh, connect ends, endpoint lines um, to one another if they have a different value than other than zero. And also, I know we haven't talked about polylines yet, but if you convert a line to a polyline, check the resulting polyline elevation. The results may be totally unexpected because you've applied um, some type of Z value to your lines. So just keep that in mind. So I'm going to clean up my drawing a little bit and delete some of these lines and start new. So I'm just going to do the erase command, E for erase. I'm going to use my selection tools. So I'm going to type in all, press enter to select all the objects, and then press enter again. And we've deleted everything in our file. So let's talk about the different ways that you can specify points on screen to uh, draw a line. So for this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, um, I'm just going to draw a simple uh, box. Um, but I'm going to show you about three different ways of drawing it. The first method I'm going to show you is by typing in a coordinate value. So we're going to type in an X, Y, and Z coordinate value to draw a line. So I'm going to execute the line command. And then it says specify first point. So again, this is X, Y, and Z coordinate. So I'm going to type in 0, 0, 0. And that will put me on that coordinate. Next, I'm going to draw the, uh, I'm going to go five units over to the right. For a straight line so here I'll do 5 comma 0 comma 0 so it goes 5 units over to the right then we'll go 5 units up so I'll do 5 comma 5 comma 0 and then we'll go uh, 5 units to the left so here we'll, we'll type in 0 comma 5 comma 0 enter and now to go back to the beginning either I can do 0 comma 0 comma 0 enter or I can just simply do C for close and there's an easy way of drawing a, a square. So let me do the erase all command. And this time we're going to draw the same square, but we're going to draw it using angle and distance. So I'm going to execute the line command again. So I'll just do L for line. Or I can just do the space bar. And I'm going to type in 0, 0, 0 for our first point. Okay, next what I want to use is the at command. I'm going to say at this point, I want to go over five units at an angle of zero degrees and then press enter. Next I want to go up five units at an angle of 90 degrees so I'll repeat the at command five units at an angle of 90 and we go straight up. Next I want to go five units to the left at an angle of 180 degrees so I'll use at symbol five units at an angle of 180, enter. And then I want to go back down, so I'll do at five units at an angle of 270. And there we go. Press enter, and there's the same square. So we'll go ahead and uh, erase all this again. So I'll use E for erase, type in all, press enter twice. So the next object we're going to look at is how to draw arcs. So to create an arc, you can specify a combination of center, end point, start point, radius, angle, a chord length, and direction values. Arcs are drawn in a counterclockwise direction by default. But you can hold down the control key as you draw to drag in a clockwise direction. So let's take a look at different ways to draw the arc. So again, on the home ribbon, on the draw panel, we're going to 
come up here to the top, we're going to choose a three-point arc. So again, just kind of follow the screen, it says, uh, the command line. It says arc, specify start point of arc, or I can specify the center. Or we're going to specify the start point first, so I'm going to left click. There's the start point. I'm going to pick a second point from my arc. And I'm going to pick a third point from my arc. And there you have it, it's a three point arc. So let's take a look at how to draw a three point arc. So I'm going to bring my cursor over the command and it shows that I can click the first point where the second point location is at and the third point location. Let's just try that real quick. So I'm going to click first point, second point, and third point to do an arc. Let's look at other options to draw an arc. So let's do start, center, and end. I'll let the flop menu come up. It shows me first point, middle point, and end point to do an arc. So we'll do start, center, and then end. Again, if you want to switch the direction that you're going in, you can hold down the control key and it flips the arc the other direction. Last we'll do start, center, and then we'll type in a length, or we can specify length. So here's start, center, now it wants to know the length of your arc. So either I can manually click on the screen, or I can type in a distance. I'll type in five, and we get half an arc. Let me go ahead and use the erase command to delete all this. So I'll come up here to my modify tool. When it asks me to select objects, I'll type in all. Press enter a couple of times and we have a clean drawing again. So let's create a few circles. So on the draw command, I'm going to go to the pull down menu and choose center radius. So it says to specify center point for radius. Maybe I want to use my coordinate system at a five units over to the right, five units up with a zero elevation. So let's type that in, five comma five comma zero. And there is a center point of my circle. Next it's asking me to specify the radius. By default you have a radius. If I want to switch to diameter, I could type in D, click on the word diameter, or I can right click and choose diameter. But if you just move your cursor out, you can get some feedback as to uh, the distance that your, um, of your rect of your circle, the radius, or I could just type in the distance. So maybe I'll come out to the right here a little bit, and I'll type in, let's say, 5. And I, got, I get a 5 radius, a 5 unit radius circle. What other options do we have? We have uh, options for 2 point circle. So I can uh, go 2 points, 1, 2. We have a tangent, tangent radius circle. Oh, excuse me, let's go back up a little bit. We have a three point circle. So we'll do a top quadrant, bottom quadrant, and then we'll specify the left quadrant of our circle. And then we have a uh, tangent, tangent radius. So I can uh, do, let's see, if I bring my cursor over the edge, notice I get this little glyph that shows up. That means I am about to click or create a tangency to this circle. So I'll left click here, a tangent to this circle, and then I can type in the radius that I want um, between these two circles. So let's do something like three. And there's my circle with a three unit radius tangent to these two circles. And then the third one we'll look at is a tangent, tangent, tangent. So this is pretty simple. I want to create a circle that's tangent between these three circles. So I'll go tangent, tangent, and tangent, and then I get my circle. Okay, so next let's take a look at how to draw a rectangle. So when you create a rectangle, you're basically creating what's known as a polyline from specified parameters such as length, width, and rotation. And then you could define the type of corners you want that rectangle to have, whether you want it to be a fillet, a chamfer, or just a regular square. So again, on the draw menu, we're going to come up, we're going to choose rectangle, and if you just Pay, look it down. Be sure to look down at the command line to see what your options are. So specify first corner point or chamfer, elevation, fillet, thickness, or width. So let's go through a few of these. I'm just going to left click one time and bring my cursor up and it says I can specify the other corner point or area, dimension, or rotation of this rectangle. 
So let's left click and there I have a rectangle. Let's try that command again with a few other options. So again I'll left click for the first corner and let's try doing a D for dimension. It says specify the length for rectangle. Okay, let's say I want this rectangle to be 10 units. So I'll press enter. And I want the width of the rectangle to be 5. And there I have a 10 by 5 rectangle. While I'm in this command, I can either press escape to end it, or I can come down here on the bottom and I can choose, let's say, rotation. Maybe we want to rotate this square or rectangle by 45 degrees. So I'll type in R for rectangle, type in 45, press enter. Press enter again. So let's try drawing a rectangle by dimensions. Okay, so next let's draw a rectangle at a 45 degree angle with a 10 by 5 dimension. So I'm going to come up to the top, choose rectangle, left click on the screen, and I have area dimensions and rotation. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose rotation. As you can see, I can move my cursor around and it follows it around. Um, want me to left click and specify rotation. I'm going to type in 45 degrees instead and press enter. Then next it says I can either pick a corner point for the size or I can do area, dimension, or rotation. So I'll do D for dimension and I'll do 10 for my length and then 5 for my width. Now I'm done drawing my rectangle so I'll left click to end that command. Alright next let's take a look at how to draw an ellipse. Same steps if I go up to my draw command. Come down a little bit. We've got three different ways to draw an ellipse. We have center point first and then you click the outsides to define your ellipse. So let's try that. So I'll click center. I'll uh, go up to the top and then move your cursor around. You can see how you can give your cursor, uh, you can give your ellipse in a shape. Again you can type in distances if you need to. Another option would be to go down and we'll do axis in. So we'll choose two axes and an endpoint. So we'll do axis, axis, and then in. And then we'll do an elliptical arc. So first we'll specify the axis endpoint of an elliptical arc. Then we'll specify the other endpoint of the axis. Then we'll specify the distance to the other axis. And then we can specify our angle. And then we can specify our end angle. So again, the steps are pretty simple. Just always follow the command line. Instead of trying to second guess what you need to do next, follow the command line and it'll walk you through the steps and I direct you in, in what you need to do. Okay, next we're going to draw is a polyline. A polyline is also referred to as a 2D polyline. A 2D polyline is a chain of line segments and or arcs that are all at the same elevation. So they don't have to be at zero elevation. They could be 1, 2, 3, 4 elevation or negative 1, 2, 3, 4 elevation. Depends on what you specify when you're drawing it. So we're just going to draw a couple, show a couple examples of a polyline. So on the draw menu, up on top, right hand corner is a polyline. A polyline is a connected sequence of segments created as a single planar object. So let's try that. I'm just going to left click and follow the command line. It says P line start point. So I'll left click and it says specify next point. I'll left click again just a few times just kind of give you a quick example of what a polyline may look like. I'll right click and choose enter. Now when I come back and select this, it selects it as an entire object. It's not four line segments, it's actually one whole segment or one object. So let's go ahead and I'm going to erase that and we'll draw another polyline. So this time I'll specify my polyline, I'll click. And then if I look at the command line, I can specify an arc, half width, length, undo, or width. So let me click one more time and this time I'll do an A for arc. And you can see here that you can specify an arc. It's still one whole object. I can go back to drawing a line by clicking L for line. 
and now I'm drawing line segments again. Press enter and then go back and select my polyline. It's all one object. If I want to change the elevation of this object, I can go to properties and then come up to elevation and then type in, let's say, 5. So let's look at how we may use the polyline to draw an arrow. So let's go to the polyline command and it says specify first point. So I'm going to left click on the screen and this time I'm going to go down and choose the width option. And we'll do a starting width of 1, enter, and an ending width of 1, enter. So now if I'm going to zoom in here a little bit, you can see that we get a, a thick white line. So I want to specify my endpoint. I'm going to left click. Now I want to create my arrowhead. So I'll do W for width again. And this time I'll do a starting width of 2 and an ending width of 0. And then bring my cursor out. And we have an arrowhead. So I'll right click and choose enter. Now this is a lot better to draw it this way because this is just one object. Instead of drawing a bunch of outside lines and then coming back and hatching the inside to create an arrow, that would make my uh, drawing a lot larger. But doing simple objects like this where it's just one object will uh, make your file size smaller. And it's also you can go back and actually um, look at the properties and change some of the values. So I can go back and maybe click on the grips. if I want to change the arrowhead size. Um, with polylines you can go back and create some editing. So I can actually stretch this out a little bit. I can right click and uh, choose edit polyline. And it says to enter option, close, join, edit vertex, spline, curve, reverse, or undo. I could choose Edit Vertex. You can see how it puts an X at that vertex. Um, I can choose the N for Next if I want to go to the next one. It might be hard to see um, with a black background on a white arrowhead, but it actually does move that X around. I can choose uh, Insert if I want to put like a, uh, another vertex in that location. You can see how it gives me a, a tracking line off of that vertex. And then just hit escape when you're done editing. Uh, if I try something a little more simpler here, let me just do a regular polyline. And I'll go back and select it. Maybe I want to put a, a vertex here at this, um, at this grip. I can bring my cursor over it and choose add vertex. And it breaks that polyline into two. I can bring my cursor over to this grip and I can say uh, convert to arc. And now we can move it up a little bit. So you can see that uh, actually polylines even have some additional editing techniques. If I did draw two lines, so say I drew a line here, and I went back and drew another line, that's two objects, but I did want to convert those into a line because maybe I wanted to uh, put a nice. Uh, fill it or chamfer here and maybe turn this into a contour. Uh, the ideal thing would do is would be to turn this uh, into polylines. So what I can do is use what's known as the join command. So if I come up to the modify screen and then I find my join command here and then select the two lines and then right click I can go back and then pick it. Now I have one polyline. And then I can go back and do some editing. I can convert to arc, add a vertex, or whatever it is that I need to do. There is some functions that you can do with polylines. Um, you convert polylines to an alignment. So if I go to alignment, I would normally uh, say create alignments from object and that would give me the option to pick a line or a polyline. Uh, polylines can be converted to feature lines in Civil 3D. Polylines can be converted to pipe networks. Polylines can add be added to a surface as break lines. Polylines can be added to a surface as a contour. But uh, polylines cannot be converted to a profile but the regular line command can. Okay, so that ends the session for creating objects. The next session we're going to look at is the status bar.
and all the commands that we can use in conjunction with creating objects and modifying objects. Okay, so in the next session, what we're going to learn about is the status bar. The status bar is located at the bottom of the user interface. This bar displays information about the current drawing that we're in and also provides us access to commands that can be applied to the drawing. And we're going to cover commands that are most commonly used in this chapter. So if we go back into Civil 3D, down the bottom right hand corner here is we have our status bar. If you hover your cursor over the icons, it displays a tooltip presenting you with the name of that command. If the icon is blue, that means that particular command is turned on. If the icon is gray, that means that command is turned off. Also, if you bring your cursor over the commands, it shows you the function key or the shortcut key that you can use to turn those items off or on. So if you left click on it, it turns it on. Some of these, if you right click on it, you'll get additional options. So for example, if we take a look at object snaps, we can right click and show all the different object snaps that are turned on with a check next to them. If we click on it, it'll actually turn that object snap setting off. We can also right click on them and we can take a look at the settings and it'll bring up a dialog box for a lot of these as well. If you notice up on the top, there's also a series of tabs for some of these. These tabs correspond to the icons that are down here on the bottom. Some of the commands might not be displayed or they seem missing. To turn on additional commands, select the customization icon on the far right to make a selection. So if you left click on the customization icon, it comes up and it shows you a check box next to the ones that are currently turned on. If you select one, let's say for example coordinates, you'll see we have a coordinate display down here on the bottom of our status bar now showing us an X and Y value when we move our cursor around on the screen. So the first one we're going to look, take a look at is how to use object snaps. What object snaps enable you to do is to quickly select an exact geometric point on an existing entity while it having to know the exact coordinates on those endpoints. So for example, if I have a line drawn and I want to come back and draw exactly at the end point of that line or the midpoint of that line, I'm going to use what's known as object snaps. So I can come down here, right click on object snaps and I can select endpoint. Now if I select the line command again, I bring my cursor near that object, you'll see a glyph shows up. That glyph means that I'm about to snap to the end point of that object. If I left click, that invokes the end point object snap. I can come back here, I can right click and I can turn on midpoint. If I invoke the line command again, and move my cursor, I get an end point and a midpoint object snap. So I can click and come back down, click again, and then click at the end point of that line. Additional object stamps we have is center point. So if I have a circle, and I want to snap to the center point of it, I bring my cursor near it, and you'll see a glyph show up. Let me go back here and turn it on showing I'm about to snap to the center point of that circle. The next one we have, uh, let's take a look at geometric center. So if I have a rectangle drawn, and I want to snap to the center of that rectangle, bring my cursor anywhere this edge, and you'll see a glyph show up. Bring your cursor near the inner of it, near to the center of it, and it'll snap to the geometric center of that particular object. Let's go down here and we'll take a look at Quadrant. Quadrant allows me to snap to the quadrant of a circle. So you can see the glyph show up for the quadrant. Next we have Intersection. Let me go ahead and turn some of these off here. So here we'll choose Intersection. If I have two lines that cross, and I want to snap to the intersection of those lines. Bring my cursor, I get an X. Let's me snap to the intersection. So we have next here. We have extension. 
So let's see if I have a line drawn here. And I want to snap to the extension of this line. If I move my cursor over it, you notice I kind of call this scrubbing. If you scrub over it, tracking line will come off the extension of the existing object and allow you to snap on the same plane as that object. That's known as extension object snap. Insertion, we'll take a look at that when we're inserting blocks. Next we have perpendicular. So if I choose perpendicular, execute the line command, I'm going to move my cursor over an object, I get the perpendicular glyph. If I click on it, I draw a line coming off of that object perpendicular. If I start a line out here, and I want to draw perpendicular to this object, simply bring my cursor over it and it will show that when I left click it's going to snap perpendicular to that object. So we have tangent. So again if I have a circle drawn, let's go over here to this, uh, this example on the left, let me delete some of these. If I start my line command I can bring my cursor over this object and see how I get the tangency glyph. If I click I'm invoking tangency. I can go tangent between one circle to the next. Sometimes if you have too many turned off, it's not sure what to do. So let's go down here. This is a good example or a good point to turn some off of these other snaps. And let's see if we can get a better result with our tangent icon. There we go. So now i got tangency to tangency. We have nearest. I'll go ahead and turn tangent off. If I use the line icon, the line command, anywhere I click on this line, it's going to snap to the nearest point. So it's not an endpoint or midpoint; it just snaps nearest to that object. So the parent intersection. If I want to snap to where these two lines will eventually intersect, that's a parent intersection. So I'll execute the line command, bring my cursor. I'll gently scrub over this line without clicking on it scrub over this line without clicking on it, and then if I come out, once the two light up, they will show me where they intersect with one another. That is an apparent intersection. And then we have parallel. So let me turn these two off, and I'll turn on parallel. I'll execute the line command. If I want to draw a line parallel to this line, bring my cursor out, I'll left click, come over and just gently touch this line, once I touch it and then move my cursor away, I'll get a tracking line letting me know that I'm now drawing parallel to that line. If I selected the wrong line, I could come over, scrub over it to get rid of that glyph, come over and choose another line that I want to draw parallel to, bring my cursor out, and then my tracking line appears again. There are two modes to drawing an object, to using object snaps. There is running object snaps, Whenever you have this icon turned on, that means that object snap is always on. Once that's on, it activates anything you have checked in here. Then you have temporary object snaps. Temporary object snaps were invoked by um, invoking a command and then holding down the shift key and right clicking and you get all the same um, object snaps that you get when you go down to the status bar. But the difference is when I select this endpoint, for example, it's only going to use that endpoint snap one time. So I did an endpoint snap when I come back to it, it's no longer going to do the endpoint anymore until I do a shift right click and then invoke the endpoint snap again. That's why it's called a temporary object snap because it's not always turned on. It's not always running. So just a couple of uh, final tidbits about uh, object snaps. If you want your object snaps to ignore the elevation of an object that you're trying to pick, you can type in OSNAPZ at the command line. O -N, I'm sorry, OSNAPZ. and then set the variable to 1 and this will ignore elevations whenever you're trying to pick a point it'll it'll pick that particular point it won't worry about what the elevation of that object is it'll always pick it 
Be patient when using object snaps in Civil 3D objects. Sometimes it takes a moment for the object snaps to sort out all the data that you have on the screen. Pause your cursor where you expect the object to snap to to appear and then it will pop up. Be aware of your zoom level when running object snaps. Object snaps work even when the objects you were snapping to is off screen. For example, the closest endpoint of a line may be outside of your screen's view area. When you click the line you are drawing, they will jump off the screen off that point. So for example, if I have a line drawn, and I zoom out a little bit, and I go to do a line command again, and I do endpoint, and I bring my cursor over here, even though I don't see that endpoint, it'll still jump over to it and, and snap. Let's see if I can get this to, to do it for me. So see how it jumped off the screen, but it still went to the end point of that line. Just something to be aware. Uh, to turn off object snaps off and on or on the fly, you can just press the F3 key. And if you're not sure what function key is, once again, just bring your cursor down to the bottom. You get a shortcut menu and it tells you the function key to press to get that to turn that, um, that command off and on. And again, use shift right click to issue a temporary object snap. That's kind of something that I use more often than anything else is uh, temporary object snaps because I don't always want them running and turned on. But I do like to use the shift right key quite a bit. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the AutoCAD Map 3D Coordinate System. Down here on the bottom it shows that we just have the X, Y, and Z coordinates. But what if you want to see the coordinate system that is assigned, assigned to this file? So once again, I'm just going to real quick go to the f.menu and I'm just going to create a quick file. Uh, we'll just call it, we'll just do maybe an alignment layout file. But here we can assign a coordinate system. I think I may have uh, demonstrated this earlier. So we'll choose FL East. I'll say create open file. And then now if I type in, if I type in map status bar, I get uh, a prompt that asks me if I want to show or hide the status bar. Here I'm going to type in show. And this is one of the commands that actually is not located on the customized icon on the right. This is kind of a hidden feature. When you type that in, it shows the coordinate system that we're working in. FL83 East Zone Feet. I can click on that bound button and I can go to library. And this will bring up a dialog box that will let me choose a different coordinate zones to apply to that drawing if I didn't assign the right one in the first place when I created the file. Okay, so that's just a little shortcut. You can also, with the Civil 3D State Kit installed, is you can type in set FL East to assign the East zone. Or if you look, once I type in the word set FL, it brings me up all the other shortcut options to assign additional Florida coordinate zones to this particular file. We can quickly switch between model space and paper space in the current layout tab. So here where it says model, left click on it and it switches me over to the layout tab and puts me in um, paper space. If I select model or double click on it again, there is no active viewport so it's just going to stay in paper space. So in order to go back to model I'd come back and click in here. If I did have a viewport, I know we haven't talked about viewports yet, but real quickly, let me um, let me create a, a fast viewport here. I'll just create a rectangle viewport. Now if I choose where it says paper, it'll put me inside that viewport. And basically viewport means that I'm in model space, but looking at model space in a layout or paper space tab, okay? Next we have is ortho mode. So let's go over here and let's turn on ortho mode. It looks like it's already turned on. If you're not sure which one ortho mode is, I kind of like to come over here and left click and watch and see what icon appears in my status bar. Ortho mode basically constrains the cursor movement to the horizontal or vertical direction of your um, crosshair. So with the ortho command turned on, I can type in line, press enter, click on the screen, and then I'll type in 5, press enter. 
can see that we've got the beginning of a line there. Let me zoom in a little closer using my scroll wheel on my mouse. Then I'll go up, press 5, go to the left, type in 5, and then go down, type in 5 again. So ortho is a very good command. I uh, use it a lot. It sometimes makes a lot of uh, drawing commands uh, work a lot quicker, especially when it comes to drawing lines or moving or moving objects. Next we have is polar tracking. Polar tracking allows us to track the cursor along sp specified polar angles. So let's go down here to the bottom and we have a polar tracking icon. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. But, w but next after I turn it on, let's right click on it. Let's take a look at the settings. So I'm going to go to tracking settings and it shows right now that the incremental angle is set to 90 degrees. I can click on this down arrow and I can choose additional increment angles uh, from the pull down menu. So let's go ahead and we'll set this to 45. I'll click OK. I'll invoke the line command. Click on the screen. If I move my cursor, I get a zero degree polar angle. If I keep going up, it's going to snap to 45. So every 45 degrees, I'm going to get a tracking line. Okay, so this allows me to draw, instead of using ortho, just at zero and 90 degree angles, I can specify any angle I want to and kind of use the same concept. So I can quickly draw maybe a rectangle at 45 degree angles. Go back in here if you want to type in an additional angle. Maybe let's say, um, what's something we don't ha have in here? Maybe, a, let's say, 2 degrees. So I'll type in 2, click OK, click OK. I'm going to cursor right here. There's 0. If I move it up just a little bit, you can see how it kind of jumps from 0 to 2, and then it'll jump back to 45. Okay, so it doesn't do it in two degree increments, it'll only do it at two degrees. Okay, that is polar tracking. The next command we have is objects snap tracking. So real quick, let me draw an example to show how object snap tracking works. Object snap tracking kind of works like uh, object snaps, but instead of snapping to an object, you can track off of an object. So let's say we have this, uh, this uh, block here, and I want to draw a top view of it and a side view of this block. So what I can do is issue the line command, or actually let me go down here first and take a look at my object track, object snap tracking settings. And in order for this to work, they actually both have to be turned on. So for object snap tracking to work, Object snaps have to be turned on along with object snap tracking. So in this case, we'll, uh, we'll turn on endpoint, and we might need midpoint. And I'm going to go ahead and turn parallel off. I can also say to clear all, just as a shortcut here, then go back and turn the ones on that I want. And then click OK. I can start my line command again, bring my cursor over the endpoint of this object, and just lightly scribe over it. Scrub over it. I don't have to click on it and I get a glyph. If I bring my cursor back, it turns it off. So I can turn that one on and that one on. And once I do that, as I move my cursor away, you'll notice I get a tracking line. This lets me track to the objects that I'm snapping to. So I may want to click here. I'll go up, let's say uh, two units. I'll go to the right. I want to line up with this line. So I'll bring my cursor over it, track off of it, click. I'll go down two units, and then I can do a C for close. And then if I want to do this other side here, I can do L for line, select that object, track off of it, click, track off of that side, come up, and then type in the width of my block. Maybe it's a 10, or we'll undo. Let's do something a little smaller, maybe 5. Oops. Let me go up, then type in 5. And then I'll track off of this endpoint, come down, and there is my other line. And let's say if I have a hole in the middle of this cube that I want to draw. Well, to find the middle of this cube, I can I have midpoint turned on. So I can say midpoint, midpoint, come down, and it shows me where the two intersect, and then I can draw my hole. Then if I want to show that hole cutout in my side view here, 
I can invoke object tracking, but I want to track off the quadrant of that circle or that hole, the top and the bottom of it. So let me hit escape to in my command. I'll go back down here to object tracking or snap tracking. Let me click on the right one. I'll go back down object snap tracking and I'll turn on um, quadrant. Click OK. Use the line command again. I can track off of the top here. And I'll just come over here, make a couple lines, and then track off the bottom. And then come back and use the trim command. And trim these objects away. Okay. So that's how object snap tracking works. Next we have is selection cycling. Selection cycling controls the behavior when you hover over or select an object that overlaps other objects. So let me open up a drawing that's a little bit more busy that we can use for a good example. Selection cycling. So let me go up here to choose open. I'll choose civil base. Click open again. And I'll zoom in here and we have several lines here on this uh, track and we want to select one of them to delete. Well down here on the bottom we have selection cycling and it's turned on. Left click on it when it turns blue, it turns on and off. You can see the different colors. So I'll invoke the erase command, bring my cursor over these objects and it can tell that there's several objects underneath my cursor. You can tell by that little glyph that shows two squares overlapping each other. That means I have selection cycling on. I'm about to select more than one object, but it doesn't know what to select. So if I left click, it's going to bring up a box that's a selection box. When I move my cursor over it, you can see, let me zoom in a little closer here. Let me. You can kind of tell, if I move my cursor over it, you can tell that different lines highlight to help me uh, filter out what object is that I'm actually trying to pick. So then when I pick the object, and then I can right click and it'll delete that line. So that's object cycling. It's really good when you have a, a really busy file. You've got a lot of objects laying on top of one another. And uh, you're really trying to pick that one object the first attempt. Um, you can have that turned on. It's not something I leave on all the time because it, you can get in the habit of always trying to use selection cycling when picking something. Um, so only you really turn it on whenever you need it. Don't get in the habit of always, always having it on. Next, we're going to take a look at the Modify Tools. The Modify Tools, again, are on the Help ribbon under the Modify panel. We're going to take a look at the Erase Command, Move Command. We're going to look at the Stretch, Copy, Offset, and Rotate, and then finally the Explode Commands. So first, let's take a look at the erase command. I think we've been pretty familiar with this, but I'll just briefly cover it. If we have an object that we want to delete, we can come up to Home. On the Modify ribbon, we have what looks like a little uh, pencil with an eraser on it. That is the erase command. Simply left click on it, select the object that you want to erase. I'd also like to point out that when you bring your cursor over an object, a red X appears now and um, you get a gray line, so it's giving you some instant feedback, letting you know that that's the object that you're about to erase. When you're done erasing, just simply right-click, and that ends the command. Next, we'll take a look at the Move command. The Move command moves an object by a specified distance in a specified direction. You can use coordinates, grid, snaps, object snaps, direct distance entry, other tools to have objects move with precision. So if we want to take this, uh, let's say we want to take this top view here and move it. Um, on the modify command, we're going to come over here. We're going to select to move. Again, we can type in the word move or we can type in M for move to execute the command. You get the uh, crosshair turns into a pick box and the command line asks you to select objects to move it. So I'm just going to select all these objects here. So I'm going to left click once. I'm going to use a window command to select all the objects. Left click again. Now I'm done selecting objects, so I'm going to press enter or right click on the mouse 
to go to the next step. In the next step, the command line is asking me to specify base point or displacement. Base point means you're picking the point that you want to use to move the object from, and then you're going to move the object to a point. So here, um, I'm just going to just manually or just randomly pick a point and then just kind of move my cursor and you can see how the whole object is being moved by the displacement point that you picked. So next you're going to sp specify a second point or use first point as a displacement. So we, we, we can either manually left click to move it or if we want to move it a distance you can kind of take a look at that polar feedback at the uh, at the dynamic tool tip there and kind of get an idea of how far you may want to move this uh, this object. So uh, it says 38.75. I'm going to move it to, let's say, 40. So I'll just type in 40 there, press Enter, and it moves down 40 units. So that's basically how we use um, the Move command. The next option we're going to look at is the, uh, the Stretch or Move command. You can use the Stretch command to move objects if all their endpoints lie within the selected window. Um, you can turn on ortho mode or polar tracking to move an object at a specific angle. So let's take a look at uh, maybe we want to take um, this vice like object and uh, stretch it down a little bit. But the area that we want to grab is we want to grab all this in here to stretch down. So what we do is we come up here and we choose stretch and it says to select objects. Well, when I go to left click once and then left click again, notice that all the objects that's touching my window are selected and that's what's going to get stretched. So if I right click again, I'm going to pick a base point. I'm just going to pick over here somewhere and move my cursor and I'll notice how those objects get stretched. That looked like I kind of um, maybe missed a few, so let me undo this again. So I do U Enter, and let me uh, let me try the stretch command one more time. This time I'm gonna come a little higher up, because so I want to stretch those lines. Actually, let me let me do uh, let me come up this way and get that fencing window. There we go. So now it's picking up all the lines and the objects inside of it. All that is going to get stretched and moved at the same time. So I'm going to right click to go to the next step. I'm going to pick a um, a base point and then move my cursor down and you can see how those objects are uh, being stretched downwards. Um, you can type again you can type in a distance maybe I'll uh, type in 50 press enter and I've now stretched um, the base of that vice a little further down. Next we're going to look at the copy command. Uh, if we come up here to the top and let's say we wanted to um, create some additional holes up at the top here I can go over and say copy and uh, just like any other modify command they'll kind of you kind of see a, a theme here or pattern um, going on with the way the command works with these modify commands basically you select an object you done pick an object you right click to go to the next step and you pick your base point and then displacement so that's kind of how this works again we're going to select copy I'm going to select these two holes here I'm going to right click and it says to um, pick a base point. Well, what I'd like to do is, is this time do something a little different. Maybe I want to pick the midpoint of these two circles or these two holes here and copy them down to the, uh, the center of this, um, of this vice here. So what I can do is uh, we'll do a little bit of um, object snaps here. I'll do right click and I'll use this one called mid, print, mid between two points option. So I'll choose that. Next I'm going to pick my first midpoint. So I'll right click again. I'm going to choose center and choose the center of that circle. Right click again, choose the center of this circle. And then my cursor jumps over to the midpoint of those two circles. Now I want to place it down here between these two midpoints. So I'm going to do it the same thing. I'm going to shift, say midpoint between two points. This time I'll do a shift, right click and choose midpoint and choose the midpoint of this line. Shift, right click and do the midpoint of this line. Left click once more and then I copy those holes down. I'm still in the copy command. It wants to know if I want to uh, create additional copies. Um, no, that's all I want. So I'm going to right click and choose enter to end the copy command. All right, the next um, command we're going to look at is the offset command. 
Okay, so to use the offset command, um, the offset creates uh, concentric circles, parallel lines, and parallel curves. The offset command adjusts the geometry of the line to get a consistent distance between the origin and an offset line. This means that arcs will have different radii in the object, or in the offset object. So let's take a look here. Um, I'm going to recreate this offset of this arc and, um, and these two lines here. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, use my erase command and erase these uh, these few arcs, and I'll press enter. And let's go up here, and we're going to execute the offset command. The offset command is now, now uh, located down on the bottom right. You can kind of see that uh, based what the icon looks like, it looks like it's you're able to offset arcs and lines. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. And at the command line, it says specify the offset distance or through erase or layer. Um, if I want to find out what the distance is, what I would have done is I would have measured between this point and uh, this arc here to, to, to do the distance. But in this case, I don't know what that distance is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this through option. So I'll type in through. And it says to select the object that I want to offset. So I'm going to left click on this object. And when I notice how when I bring my cursor down, it's actually following um, the object is actually following my cursor around or my crosshair. So simply the next step would do would be to hold down the shift key, right click and use endpoint object snap, and then just pick this curve here. And uh, that let us offset that object while it having to actually measure the distance um, that we need. And I'll just go here and do the same thing here. I'll uh, select my line. And I'm, I'm still in the through command because that's the last command that I executed. Then I'll do the same thing, right click and choose endpoint. And there we go. So then the last thing we do is just to uh, trim up these objects. So let's take a look at the uh, trim command next. If we come up on top, again on the modify command, we have trim. So I'll select trim. Again, select the objects that we want to trim. Um, the trim works a little different. It has a, you want to select the cutting edge and then you select the object that you want to trim. So kind of think of the cutting edge as this is your, uh, this is your scissors. So you can left click, make that the cutting edge. That's your scissors. And you're going to right click and the scissors is going to cut or trim back that object. Okay, so you pick your scissors first, you pick your cutting edge, and then you pick the object that you want to trim. We can go down here to the bottom and clean this up a little bit. We can select the trim command again. But this time, uh, we're going to use a little um, shortcut here, a little tip. If you press the spacebar again, it automatically s evaluates the drawing and creates everything as a trim object. So in other words, if I bring my cursor over this, it'll just trim this back, or it'll just trim this back. So we'll go ahead and select that for trim. Go ahead and press Enter. I'll do trim one more time. Um, Use trim. We'll select this object, right click, and then uh, actually we wanted to trim it back to here, but we can't because it doesn't intersect um, this uh, arc here. So maybe what we would do is just select this, use our grips, zoom in there a little bit, do a right click and point, and then move it where we want it to go. Okay. Okay, the final modify tool we're going to look at is the rotate command. The rotate command rotates an object around a base point. Uh, by default, AutoCAD considers uh, due east to the right uh, as zero degrees. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and we're going to come up here and choose rotate. I'm going to left click and select the objects that I want to rotate. I'm going to right click and it says to specify base point. So in this case, I may do a shift right click and choose center and pick the center edge of this arc here as the rotation point that I want um, this object to rotate around. And I like the feedback that I get now in, um, in AutoCAD as to where it leaves a gray outline of the object behind that I'm rotating to let me know what all objects that I picked and where it was at and about you know where I'm placing it. I also like the fact that I get this tracking line now that moves around. So the next thing you could do is uh, you can either specify a rotation angle or zero degrees uh, by default. Or we can do a copy uh, where it creates a copy of the object and rotates the object at the same time. But in this case, we just want to rotate it. So I'm going to bring my cursor down 
uh, straight down below and just left click and we rotated the entire object. I'm going to do undo one more time and we'll take a look at what happens if you do copy. So I'll choose rotate. Once again select my object. Right click to go to the next step. I'll do a shift to right click for center point. Pick the center point of this object. And this time I'll choose a copy and then it'll leave a copy of it behind and rotate it as well. And then I'll click undo to go ahead and bring that back to where we had it. All right, next let's take a look at the mirror command. What I'm going to do is just kind of draw a temporary construction line. Just for visual reference, we don't have to necessarily do this to use the mirror command. But I'm going to use this as my object of reference to mirror this object to the other side. So I'm going to go ahead and select mirror. Again, select the objects that I want to mirror. So I'm going to go ahead and put a window around all of these objects. I'm going to right click and it says to specify first point of mirror line. I'm just going to left click up here. It's using an endpoint snap. I notice when I bring my cursor down, it's already mirroring that object. It's waiting for me to, to pick a second point um, for my mirror line. So I'll just come ahead to the bottom, left click. Now, uh, this is interesting. At the bottom, the command line says, do you want to erase the source objects? The objects that I originally picked to mirror, that is my source objects. I can either say yes or no, and um, that'll be the results I get. So I'm just going to go ahead and say yes to this. And it mirrored the objects over and uh, deleted my source objects. Okay, so that's all the modified tools I'm going to cover. I think if uh, once you get familiar with AutoCAD and get a little comfortable, start using it, you can kind of see that the rest of these uh, commands kind of work similar, uh, such as scale and copy and array. Um, they kind of all work in the same uh, same fashion. So let's go down to our PowerPoint here. Okay, so back to our PowerPoint, just a real quick um, recap on what we talked about in this session. We talked about creating objects such as lines, arcs, circles, rectangles, ellipse, polylines, 3D polylines, and the flatten command. Uh, these commands are located again on the home ribbon on the draw panel. And then we talked about the status bar on the bottom right hand corner, the user interface. We talked about uh, using object snaps, how to snap to the geometry of an object, whether it's a center point, midpoint, or endpoint, intersection, so forth and so on. We talked about the AutoCAD map coordinate system and how to apply a coordinate system to a drawing when it's being created, and how to turn on the um, maps workspace uh, dialog bo um, box at the bottom of the status bar. And then once we did that, we looked at how to switch between the model space and paper space. We looked at ortho mode, polar tracking, uh, how to track off of an object very similar to object snaps. Then we went through a selection cycling, which gave us the ability to pick objects that are stacked on top of each other, how to get a dialog box and be more specific as to what object that we wanted to uh, select. And then we uh, talked about modify tools. Again, this is on the home ribbon under the... Um, uh, modify panel, we went over erase, move, stretch, copy, rotate, and explode. So in the next session, we're going to cover, uh, this will be a session um, 3 of 3. We're going to talk about working with layers. We're going to go over the Layers Property Manager, and all the settings, and that dialog box, and uh, talk about layer states that are in the F.Civil 3D State Kit. And then talk about block basics. We'll go into inserting a block from a tool palette. Um, how to use existing blocks that are in a drawing, how to browse for blocks that may reside in another drawing, and then we'll take a look at all the block settings. And we'll also go over um, just how to create a basic uh, Firebell alarm block and how to uh, insert it into the file and how to change it and have it mash change all the other uh, blocks in that file as well. Then we'll talk about uh, paper space and model space. We'll get more uh, in detail about what those two tabs are for and how they work in relation to uh, printing and plotting. And then there we'll go into uh, printing and plotting essentials. We'll talk about getting ready to print, how to do a page setup, and insert pages from our uh, templates that we have in the state kit, such as um, additional title blocks or um, um, uh, print settings from other templates. And then last but not least, we will talk about external references, or otherwise known as XREFs. We'll look at the external reference uh, dialog box, and we'll look at how to take one drawing and uh, bring it in as a background to another file, and how we can draw on top of it and reference other drawings. 
Uh, we'll take a look at the settings and then we'll talk about what the difference is between a reference type uh, attachment or what a reference type overlay is. All right, so thank you very much and look forward to seeing you in the next session. Again, my name is Mike Rocca. I work in the plant production office CAD department uh, for the Florida Transportation. Thank you.